Sometimes you just need to take the slips out and bowl defensively. And you also need to be careful with your computer's defense as well. If you need a VPN, go Nord. NordVPN.com forward slash Kimber to get a two year contract with a discount plus four extra months and gifts in some markets. It's completely risk free with Nord's 30 day money back guarantee. The link is in the show notes. So put in some dot balls and turn them into maidens via NordVPN.com forward slash Kimber. Welcome to the Wagon Wheel. I'm Jared Kimber, and uh, this is the Cricket Podcast, where we, or me, because I'm the only one on this Cricket Podcast, uh, talk, uh, answer your questions about the game. Nothing is too nerdy, although, you know, some people will try and stretch that, and I would probably try and stretch that, so that's fine. Best way to ask questions is if you're live on the YouTube, uh, the uh, Super Chat function. I think you might also be able to reply on Twitter or something, but I don't really know how that one works. Um, but the majority of people get their questions in early on Patreon. So it is patreon.com forward slash Jared Kimber. Also, if uh, if you uh, interested in some of the things that we talk about here, a lot of these same sorts of topics are covered in uh, on our website, goodareas.co, where you can also get access to all the videos because we have two different channels, of course, and podcasts as well. And everything is there if needed. But let's start with the show. Will says, in a T20 match, you're entering the 15th over. The batting side is seven down. Would the smart play to bring on an expensive bowler who might clean up the tail, or do you focus on economy? I suppose it also depends partly, Will, on where the game is. Are they score, Have they been scoring above par or below par so far? And what the tail is like. Um, you know, if uh, Tig Shana is batting at number 11 or um, Adil Rashid is batting at number 11, you might think, well, might as well just try and keep the economy down. Uh, but if you have an explosive bowler available to you in a normal situation, let's say par score of 15th over, uh, seven wickets down with the sort of normal nine, 10 and 11 uh, available to you, then yeah, you'd probably try and get rid of them as quickly as possible. Um, I'm trying to think, I reckon I saw an IPL team do something like this recently. So yeah, um, it is something that we see on occasion. Ben says, as a parent, how would you introduce a child to cricket? Also, if you had the power to choose the handedness, which hand would they bat and bowl with? So I think I've told this story before, but so I have three children. So two of my boys are actually at a cricket camp today. I need to finish this podcast and go pick them up from cricket camp. Um, th they already played their starting proper cricket this year. Um, uh, they've just done training and, and everything so far. There's no real hurry. Um, I taught both of them to bat left-handed. And the reason is, is I think batters stand on the wrong side of the ball. And I think right-handed is actually left-handed and left-handed is actually right-handed in cricket because of the top hand and the way that we play. So I think it's very different to golf or um, baseball in, in that way, which is why you see David Warner and Adam Gilchrist and all these sorts of left-handers are actually right-handers. Uh, so that's the way I, I would I would do that. And I did do that with my kids. The funny thing was I did that with my kids and then it turns out one of my kids actually is a left hand, <laughs> which had never occurred to me to, that I, you know, that that would happen. So one of my boys bowls right arm and bats left handed and the other one bowls left arm and bowls um, and bats uh, uh, left hand. So I, I kind of, I got um, uh, ruined by my own thing. But to be, to be, to be fair, um, that's the way I went about it. But if you're talking about just in general, I, you know, I just, the first thing is just the ball. Like my, my daughter is what, three and a half? No, almost four now. Um, and I just spent a lot of time with her getting a, a ball. And then we occasionally, because we play a bit of cricket in the backyard, of course, and occasionally she will come out and we let her bat. We let her throw the ball at her brothers. And she loves that. I've always felt that the first, the first thing they get is, you know, everyone loves playing with balls, whether you're going to play cricket or not. Um, but the first really magical thing about cricket is, and I remember this of my youngest when he, he must have been about two and a half, uh, you know, very, very young, but he had a bat in his hand and we threw a ball and he hit it and it hit the middle and he felt the middle and the way the way the way the ball went away and just that excitement. And I just went through that. And then, you know, our, my, my kids have developed like they're two boys and they're what, 15 months difference in age. Um, 16 months difference, 18 months. I don't know. It's not long. I should know. 
yeah, 18 months, um, 17 months. I'll get this right eventually. And when you, when they were growing, my oldest boy just has trouble trusting his natural instincts and he's not a very good mimic. So once he gets something, he's very good at it. So the first thing that he worked out in cricket was defense, right? When he was young, he would hit so many balls over the fence, but he didn't really know what he was doing. And then one day he realized, well, wait a minute, I won't go out very much if I do this. And so there was a recent game, uh, like a, like a, a, you know, a softball game that he played in where he had like eight batting partners. <laughs> Everyone on the other end just kept going out and he just kept doing that. And he would look for gaps and he did it completely naturally. So that's where we push him towards. That's the thing that comes naturally to him. We're still trying to teach him how to bowl better. Um, I've also been showing him about wiki keeping. So he has other skills if, if he needs them. You know, um, you know, do you enjoy this? Do you want to field here? Do you want to try this now? All that sort of stuff. But the thing that he likes best is batting for as long as possible, right? And he will bat in the backyard for a long time until me or his brother can bowl him out. The other guy's very different. The other guy wants to do everything um, and he is a mimic. So he sort of just taught himself how to bowl without me having a lot to do with it. He's got a really Sam Curran-like bowling action, as in he sort of comes in, he doesn't have a big leap or anything, you know, left arm, not a hugely strong front arm at the moment, but just natural in-swing. And so probably by the time he was seven, maybe even six, um, he could swing the ball back in. And this, we're talking about a plastic ball, you know, seam, taught him seam up and away he went. Really natural with a bowling, quite straight bowls, kids for fun over and over again with his batting clearly he's the sort of kid who just wants to whack it i have taught him and i give him options about uh, how to defend and occasionally he will do that he usually he will watch some clips or we will play some uh, uh, cricket on on the playstation and he'll learn some things and then next thing you know he's playing that shot in the backyard He's very, very natural. He did this with tennis. Before he learned how to serve at his tennis lessons, um, he watched um, adults on the court next to him doing it and taught himself how to serve. So he's, a, he's a very much a mimic of whatever he has seen. So, you know, he's currently um, massively into basketball. And so he does that. So again, so what do I feed him? Oh, come and have a look at this batter. And I show him the more aggressive batters because that's what he likes. That's kind of what you do with children. This isn't a cricket thing. This is how you kind of do anything. You work out what they like. You work out what suits them. And then you feed it to them. And then as they develop, you develop with them, right? You know, your, your children might like birds when they're five or dinosaurs when they're five. When they're eight, they might not like dinosaurs anymore. You find that new thing and you keep finding it and you show them stuff and you talk to them about it and, and you find what will interest them whether it be playing or watching or whatever, and you just keep going with that. That, I'm, that, you know, I'm not an expert, but I do have three of the things now. Uh, Samir says, apparently there was talk South Australia were gonna offer Dean Elgar uh, a deal to overcome their 28 year shield draft. Love that Dean Elgar was gonna win the Sheffield Shield. Uh, but there was significant pushback from Gillespie and other players. Uh, Gillespie has since left. I thought Gillespie was leaving for the Pakistan job. Samir, so I don't know if these things are linked. Um, I don't know Dizzy well enough uh, to get an answer from him um, specifically on, on this sort of thing. I would say it would not be beyond South Australia to pull a bit of a bonehead move. Just at a time, I think they are producing better cricketers and there is a bit of a wave going towards them. Um, but the South Australian cricket has been in a hole for, what? Oh, it'd be unfair to say since the chapels, but kind of since the, what, Gillespie, Blewett, Lehman era. I mean, it really has been dire for a very, very long time. You know, that whole Ryan Harris thing that went on a few years ago, um, really kind of disappointed with with uh, with what they've been able to do. And and to be honest, you go back traditionally, we did this on Cricket 8, the, the South Australian greatest, um, uh, it was South Australian greatest cricket, 11. They released this recently. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, yeah, they released the official one. Let me find the official one. Here it is. And it's bizarre, right? So this is the men's team. So who would be their best women's player? Uh, Megan Schutt. Uh, who else have they got in? Oh, Shelly Nitschke, Karen Rolton. So a couple of very, very good women's players. Men, men's team is opening with Clem Hill and Greg Blewett. Clem Hill, 
probably a great player in his era. I've got absolutely no problem with him. Greg Blewett, um, kind of, you know, a fringe international player, but I think we all know how talented he was. At first drop is Bradman. Bradman moved to New, uh, from New South Wales. Um, so not actually a South Australian player, but okay, but you know. Then you've got the two Chapels and Lehman. It's a pretty strong four, five, six there. At seven, they have Sobers. Barbados is a long way from South Australia. At eight, they have Barry Jarman as a wicketkeeper who, you know, good clubman, but I mean, it's incredible that, that he's the best uh, wicketkeeper batting option that they had. Um, then they have Clary Grimmett. So Clary Grimmett, famously from New Zealand. <laughs> Probably, I'd be shocked if he moved to South Australia before he was 30. Maybe he's 28, 29. I, I don't know. Um, uh, Jason Gillespie, great bowler. Rodney Hogg, Victorian. So uh, again, that is... Uh, and then uh, and then as 12th, they have uh, Jeff no uh, Noblet. It's really... The history of South Australian cricket is really weak at outside of like one family um finding cricketers it's it's bizarre to me and you know you, i can only go on modern times but they just feel like they're always making mistakes in south australian cricket so i have no idea if this is true to me what i am saying though is nothing would surprise me about south australian cricket i think they've been really disappointing all the way through their history um up and you know including them picking their greatest ever 11 of a bunch of players who are not even from there uh Oh my God, we've got double chapel questions here. James says, Australian cricket law generally holds that of the chapel brothers, Ian was the superior captain or Greg was the superior batter. Um, how do you think Greg stacks up as a captain? Look, I, I think we, it, it's a weird one because obviously when the, when the Kerry Packer years ended and Greg Chapel was coming back, um, there was other issues with Kim Hughes and, and the team and the team was split. So, you know, that side of it, I think you have to look at it from that point of view. My my knowledge of Greg Chappell is more of Greg Chappell the coach and Greg Chappell the mentor and selector. And we've got friends in common, but I don't even know if we've ever met. I don't think we have. Um, but I know a lot of people were quite often very off-put by things that Greg Chappell would say. He's a very direct person. He can be quite brutal, but not in an Ian Chappell sort of way where Ian Chappell's like, nudging you to try and get you to be great like greg chapel just sort of says things and they came they come out really odd so i wonder if he was the sort of captain that might have riffs and not bring the team together as i think ian chapel was much more of a we're all in it together lads type of person also greg chapel was such a great batter i don't know if he's going to make the top 20 of our um, batting list of all times but he's not that far away from that and especially when you put in his World Series cricket numbers, which is him in his prime, and we missed out on him as a test batter. And he never got, went to Asia. There was all these little holes, but you look at his record and it's like, this guy was absolutely incredible. And I wonder if he found it harder to relate to people at times um, because, you know, that old thing of he could do whatever he wanted to on the field. Um, and so I, I think he probably was a weaker captain than Ian Chapel with all those things. But I've never, you know, tactically... I mean, you have to, I know this is going to sound weird, but the um, underarm Trevor Chapel thing is a genius tactical move. It was within the laws of cricket and a genius tactical move. Um, so I do think there's some elements there that he was, you know, very, uh, that he had in his uh, positive. And I think he's a genius, like I think he's in a, a genius person, the way he looks at cricket. He, but whether he has the ability to get that across to other people, like he wasn't a particularly good commentator either. I'm not sure if he has that the the right empathy and and understanding of other people and uh, verbal skills, simple things like that that his brother clearly does have. Uh, although you know, Ian Chapel maybe not the most empathetic person, but you know what I mean. And those other skills he certainly had in droves. Uh, James also says, "Have you ever covered the story of Archie Jackson on any of your podcasts?" I don't think so. Um, I don't think I've ever written on R.G. Jackson. I'm, I'd have to go back to the Test Cricket book to see if he was mentioned in there. So for those who don't know, Archie Jackson died at the age of, uh, of 23. Um, just a fantastic cricketer um, who we, we don't know how good he would have been. In first-class cricket, he averages 45.65. But in his first eight tests, he was averaging 47. Um, 
a lot of people said he had a very similar technique to Victor Trumper. So another player who took the ball from outside off stump and sort of whipped it to the leg side. Um, he played almost all of his tests at home. And I think he played, I'm just having a look now, two tests in England. So he's a similar sort of age. Uh, he might have been slightly older than Bradman, but a similar kind of age to Bradman. Um, and he plays from 1929 to uh, 1931 was his last year when he died of TB. Uh, we just don't know how, how good he could have been and uh, you know where he was going. He's, one thing I, I remember looking uh, um, him up is that, uh, and I'm just trying to find it now, yeah, he, so he, his first two tests, he averaged 69. His next two tests, he averaged 58. So at that stage, he had a massive average. And then the last three tests, he averaged seven, which was in 1931, which I think were... That was against the West Indies in at home. And so you could argue that he was just a really good player who started very well in test cricket and might have ended up being a very fine player, but not an absolute great. Or you could go the other way and be like... You know, he, he started so brilliantly and was so naturally talented and was nowhere near his prime. Who knows what he could have got to? Uh, I don't know what the truth is, but, you know, any cricketer who dies at 23, we're not going to know the full story of. And, and that's where we are with uh, Archie Jackson. Ali says, do you foresee a power struggle between the BCCI and IPL owners? It's already happening. Uh, crazy that Indian players still can't play for any other... Um, uh, IP, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, crazy the Indian players still can't play for any other T20 leagues owned by Indian oligarchs. Yeah, we did a whole podcast on it, Ali, and I don't remember which one it was now, but yeah, we did an entire podcast about this. The the BCCI, a lot of people in the BCCI were laughing at the other boards for, for ages, going, ah, uh, look at them, they can't do what we do, we're in control. And it's like, yeah, no, the owners are about to be in control. You are not going to be in control. Um, and we're getting very, very close to that. I mean, the Ambani family now own everything in cricket. So <laughs> them on their own might be more powerful than the BCCI. But you, you factor in all those different ownership groups. And yeah, I do think that uh, there is going to be a power struggle. How it, it might not play out in a particularly negative way, you know, um, but there will be a shift in the balance um, in, in the way that that goes. And it's already happening. And if I was buying up all these IPL franchises around the world, I would want to use my star players in them. Um, and I think that is the long-term, I, I think some of it is development. Some of it is about using your brand. Some of it is about having your own streaming platforms in the future. You know, all those things is why they have all these different franchises, but they are definitely thinking that into the future, they are also going to have a um, the ability to use their Indian stars and in, in at least one of the, the leagues. And it might be the hundred or... Uh, Major League Cricket, those will be the two obvious ones because those are the bigger media markets. And, you know, why take them to Australia? There's not that much money to be made from Australia. All the other leagues are smaller. But if you can buy a 100 team, which you will be able to one day, and you've already got a Major League team, getting, uh, well, not Virat Kohli, but Jaiswal um, or um, Gill or whoever, you know, your next young star is, Mike Yadav, into one of those leagues is massive, would be massive, Right. And, and, and that's what the future, that's a big part of what the plan is of, of these people. They didn't buy these teams just for fun. All right, okay, take a quick break here and, and then we'll be back with more Wagon Wheel. This is brought to you by Cricket 8. They are a new player in the game trying to educate fans on what is really happening in cricket. We have a partnership with them where we host live watch-alongs, do podcasts, and write articles. If you want to know what is really happening with our game, visit cricket8.com. If you make any content, Minbo Pro is the tool for you. Take your long format content and cut it and slice it for social media. This AI-inspired weapon will turn your one piece of work into so many clips. Try Minvo.pro now. Welcome back to Wang and Wheel. Rudra says, if Revenger Jadeja were bowling, to Revenger Jadeja, which formats would the bowler do better and which ones would the batter do better? Oh. Um, I would assume... T well, I mean, T20 would probably be the one where he would take himself down the most, I would think, wouldn't it? Uh, one day cricket, he would milk himself a little bit more. Trying to think of what his record is against left arm finger spin. I suppose that's kind of where I have to start, isn't it? So I mean, if you if you think about uh, if you think about the way that he plays, you know, he's 
very kind of pace dependent anyway when he's batting. Um, so it almost at a, at a certain point, I'm I'm not sure it even matters that much. Um, uh, but I I've got a feeling that again in T20 cricket, let's see if we look at all T20 uh, stats from that point of view. If it would be a little bit different just because of the way that just because of it's a left arm finger spinner spinning into him. The interesting thing is that whether you would use Ravi Jadeja the bowler against Ravi Jadeja the batter in T20 cricket, knowing uh, what he can do, um, you know, knowing that he's a left hander. So against left arm finger spin, he's got a strike rate of 144 in T20 cricket with an average of 33. So that's a negative right that that's not that's not a positive record that you want uh that you want to use him for and my guess would be without spending all day on 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 my my system here um that that's probably a uh, you know a far better record than he has against other kinds of spin we might actually do a video on that um at a certain point to show you know different players and and their ratios against different kinds of spin in one day cricket he's got a strike rate of 94 but an average of 70 so I think that's a really good solid record, but he's not, a run of ball is not punishing you, but you know you're not gonna get him out with it, which I think that that holds up from what we have probably seen of him. And also the role he plays in the one day team. In T20, he probably does occasionally have to take down left arm finger spin, right? Whereas in one day cricket, that's probably very rarely his role would be my thought. I can't imagine, you know, there would obviously he would face it, but it, he would face it more often when they had lost early wickets. Even even when he played at times, Akshar would be the one that they would send up uh, the order. And then in test cricket, he averages 66 against it. Um, so yeah, it's probably out of test cricket and T20 cricket, I think if we're, if we're being honest there, uh, Rudra. Um, but yeah, you, in T20 cricket, you probably wouldn't bowl left arm finger spin to him. Whereas in test cricket, you probably would. So there is a, I think that is a, a slightly different situation. Uh, Rudra says, what is your favorite performance by bowler you thought was past it? It could, that could be any of the last 10 years of Jimmy Anderson. Uh, for me, it's Malinga's four wickets versus England 2019 World Cup. Uh, but his four for four versus New Zealand um, as part of his five for six is also up there. Um, yeah, I suppose the thing, it, I mean, I'm not sure I actually thought he was past it, but Stuart Clark destroying England's top order and having Stuart Broad batting on day one at Headingley in 2009 when I had said he, I thought he should still be playing and everyone else told me he was finished, was probably not quite what you're looking for, but it's certainly one that, even I thought Stuart Clark wasn't as good, but I thought in England, you would still play him. And that one time uh, when they finally got him into the side on a wicket that was suited to him, he was unplayable. He, I don't even think he ended up with a five wicket haul, by the way, but just unplayable, brilliant bowling. That's one that really sticks in my mind. Bowlers generally don't stick around for those extra, you know, once they're gone, they're gone. Um, so I'm trying to think if there's any other bowler who I thought was finished and then still came up with wickets. So batters, it, it's much more likely for batters. Batters get a much longer tail because, the, you know, it's not so much about the athleticism at that point. So if it, once a bowler's thought to have lost half a yard, that's kind of it. Um you could you could almost say Ryan Harris's what 2013 2013 14 um entire series because I just I knew he was that good but I never thought he'd be able to put it together for that long and you know he still took wickets against South Africa in the following tour as well and then at that stage it was quite clear that you know that he was struggling a little bit more um but yeah I think I think there was I, I think that's another one that comes to my mind. But you, as I said before, you could put all of Jimmy Anderson's in there. I'm trying to think if there's any spinners. You occasionally have bowlers make a comeback, right? And I'm trying to think if there's someone who made a comeback who I thought maybe shouldn't have played. I can't think of any off the top of my head. Satchmo says, is Gary Sobers the number one West Indies batter of all time by a similar margin to how Malcolm Marshall's the number one pace bowler or would you put Henley Viv and Lara level with him? I'm not sure I have Sobers ahead of Lara. You know, we've been doing like so much research on on that and I'd have to go back and have a look at my list. I think they're both top 10. I think Viv is just outside the top 10. I could be wrong on that. 
and and we haven't factored the strike rate in so viv might get a bit more of a jump uh when we get to the strike rate but uh but yeah my memory is that lara was ahead of sobers um now one of the reasons i've marked sobers down slightly is because of where he bats in the order and that's not particularly his fault because he's not um because <laughs> he could have batted higher up in the order but it's an easier position uh, to bat in you know you, you're saying for adam him and adam gilchrist have incredible records but they were coming in against bowlers who'd already bowled two or three spells you, you know you talk to the english bowlers Darren goff always says that adam gilchrist was the hardest batter he ever bowled to not that he was the best but any other batter chances are you were you were still bowling to them with the new ball or you're bowling to them in your first couple of spells and you had a chance and, and they would look nervous and and, and everything else you, you're bowling to gilchrist with the balls 60 overs old and australia's just lost their you know if, if you're lucky um you've got him in at 60 overs old um and the bowlers are all exhausted when they're coming on to bowl to him uh and he's whacking around well sobers did that a lot you know with great batters ahead of him as well so th this is not to say that those players are not great but lara clearly had to bat with i mean lara spent the second half of his career with what one other great batter and how many other par batters right that's very different than the side that sobers was in so i and so i do and also sobers um didn't you know probably had a um the the eras were a little bit different the pitches were different all those sorts of things but I think you make a claim that either of them is the best West Indian batter. I talked to Bumble actually recently, and he obviously saw a lot of them, and he had those two basically par. Um, I think that's maybe the fairer way of putting it, but if I was ranking it, I might have one slightly higher than the other just because that's how numbers work. Ellie says, how do English counties make money that they are able to sign overseas players consistently? Are the crowd sponsorship at first-class matches big enough to afford such professionalization? Uh, yeah, th not all of it. Um, so counties, uh, it, it, it actually costs, I think, far too much, but it costs a bit to go to county games. I know it would be, what, 15 or 20 quid per ticket. So that's probably more than international tickets in most parts of the world. Uh, you get a good, consistent amount of people. Obviously, they come for multiple days. There's also county memberships. Um, the counties generally, not always, but own the ground or at least can use that land for other things. So that's why you have hotels in so many grounds uh that's more a modern thing and the other modern thing is concerts and uh, uh business business events so like the oval for instance you can hire out a room at the oval and have your you know a business party at or a, or a meeting at or whatever you wanted to do and people do that sort of stuff all the time you've also got the local sponsorship angle like you know during that summer period if you don't have a big football team then you know Derby cricket team is one of the bigger things in Derby, right? Uh, so you, you've you've got those that element to it as well. Uh, the the you know cricket is a middle class and upper class sport in England. So the uh, available income for shirts and and um, food and all that sort of stuff is higher than um, for some other sports in the UK. Uh, they get really good crowds to T20 games. They get pretty good crowds to list A games. Yeah, maybe less so now that, you know, the 100 and the Blast exist. But traditionally, they got really good crowds. Um, there's a lot of cricket played, so they can cash in a lot when it comes to sponsors and ticket sales. Uh, and then uh, quite a few of those grounds, what, six or eight of them, probably also get money from hosting international events which is, and regular international events, right? Uh, it, it's a big advantage to the, you know, to, the, to those particular teams. Um, and then they also get a slice of the pie of the, um, of the TV rights deal, which they should, because they are the ones who started it, right? In, in, international cricket is what, how England makes its money now, um, although who knows what will happen in the future, but that's how they make the money at the moment. And county cricket built international cricket. It's why we are where we are uh where are we here where are we raul says how do you rate ponting as a coach i think ponting is very very good at captaincy at coach at the little things that don't show up very well making people feel confident you know i remember remember someone from the australian camp were talking about marcus stoinis 
and they said every time Ricky Ponting was around, he was just like, he grew 10 foot. And it's because he had Ricky Ponting throwing balls to him in the nets. He had his childhood hero throwing balls to him, trying to make him better. And, and I remember asking him, do you think, you know, technically he's helped? And they're like, maybe, maybe he would not help any more than a normal batting coach, right? But Marcus Stoinis feels better with that. And there are little things you go back through his captaincy and his coaching that he does very, very well from that point of view. I think he's very good at growing a group and organizing it and making sure that each player is a little bit better. I'm not sure he's as good at building a squad, although I thought Delhi had a very good squad under him uh, a couple of years ago. And I don't think he's as good as the tactical side of things. And I think he's still a little bit old fashioned when it comes to coaching T20 cricket. But I do think for the right team, I think he would be an outstanding coach. And for the wrong team, I think he'd be a really poor coach. And, and that's kind of going to be my answer all the time because Rob Barron on Cricket 8 is always asking me who the best coach is in cricket. And the truth is that there is no best coach in cricket because there are certain situations I would love to have Andrew McDonald. And there are certain situations I would love to have Brendan McCullum. There are certain situations I would love to have Mickey Arthur, right? And these are very, very different leaders and the way they do things and, and the way they go about it. Sometimes it's different teams and sometimes it's different formats. And also, you know, we, we're in a situation where uh, Daniel Vittori keeps getting these major coaching jobs and we have a bad record for him. But I'm also not sure how much it is completely his fault that he has a bad record. It's a really, really tough one when you look at, at, at these things. And so I think there are certain situations that Ricky Ponting would be an ideal coach and there are other situations I probably wouldn't want someone like him to coach. Uh, Matt says, do you think that VR has any utility in cricket training? If you're approached by a developer for advice, what would you ask them to try and create? So yes, I, I do think, I, I think there are little things that are really, really important. Like for instance, when, uh, you know, it would work better for batting. I don't know if you can do VR for bowling. I mean, maybe you can, but let me think of batting at the moment. Where is the batter looking? Because my guess is that the vast majority of form fluctuations in cricket is that the batter stops looking at the spot that they should be looking at. So uh, they start to look at the bowler's head or they start to look at the bowler's body. Um, they don't look, they don't focus on the hand correctly, whatever that may be. I think that is a big part of it. So VR instantly could help there. Also, what does Steve Smith look at from the time the bowler's at the back of the mark to the front of the mark? And how can we train other batters through VR to do similar kinds of things? Those are the things that we've never been able to, to, to train. And the third one, that, and I think VR would help with this as well. The third one is, we know there are lots of great batters out there who up until 75 miles an hour are absolutely brilliant and can smash anyone, right? And the minute it gets over 75 miles an hour, they have absolutely, they can't hit it. And the reason is, is they are tracking the ball with their eyes. And once it gets over 70, 75 miles an hour, you can't track the ball. It mo it's moving too quick, right? Is there a way using VR that we can tra uh, that we can train batters to watch the ball for the first three meters and then move their eyes down where the ball is going to finish, right? If you can unlock that, and it's, I would assume that is much easier to do with VR than it would be actually um, in a game because you're literally telling people or, or with a real ball I should say because you're literally telling people stop looking at the ball I want to train you it's come out now go here it's come out now go on here and I would assume that VR would work better from those sorts of points of view the the VR I've seen so far there's a guy on TikTok who does VR videos and they occasionally come up in my feed it doesn't look like he's playing proper shots so at the moment it doesn't look like VR is able to replicate that and you know my memory of Wii Cricket uh, which is, uh, you know, not quite VR, was was very similar to that. But if you can train people on where to look and how to look and change the way they are looking at stuff, I think that's really, really important. Uh, Ian says, does the county championship schedule make any sense? I mean, I would argue it never did. Um, is seven four-day games in the first eight weeks too much? Australia have asked for Nathan Lyon to sit some out. Um, so what hope for the fast bowlers? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose it's slightly different. Um, uh, I suppose it's slightly different from that point of view only because, uh, you know, Nathan Lyon is the most important uh, non-seam bowler in Australian cricket and Australia is pretty pretty good at resting their players and, 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 you know, not doing anything from that point of view. So that is slightly different. 
But your bigger point, Ian, is if you know if you are a fast bowler, you should not be playing seven game, seven four day games in eight weeks. I think we all know that, um, and um, you know that's. <laughs> I, I don't think any of us need to be sports scientists to work that out. It's just, it's too much, it's too much long spells in a short period of time. Aditya says, the latest Crick Picks episode regarding the ultimate T20 draft was really good. One player who I thought was worth discussing was Sky. How far is he from the all-time 11? I'm trying to remember who's in the middle order, Aditya, um, on that particular one. Uh, have I got Crick Picks here? He says, hey, here it is. Uh, I've got the full list in front of me. Uh, so when did we do that one? <laughs> uh, so yeah, so if you haven't seen Crick Picks, we, we quite often draft our, um, our favorite uh, players or, you know, different kinds of things. But this is different. This is one where we all had to pick a player in draft order. So we would have, let's have a look. Glenn Maxwell, A.B. de Villiers, David Miller, Hardik Pandya as the middle order guys. So Hardy Pandya probably stays. Andre Russell is later on, but he obviously stays as well. AB de Villiers stays. So I think Sky for Maxwell um, is fair. And you could also, I think you could make a claim that Sky for Miller is almost there already. So yeah, I think he's got a really good claim for that. He probably, it just needs to continue to do it for a couple more years. Um, but he's been fantastic, uh, you know, and I don't know if he was in the conversation, but I don't think he was that far away. He was on one of my lists anyway. But I, I just thought that the other guys had, you know, a slightly better record when it, when it came to that. Uh, Samir says, with Steve Smith, if he doesn't score as an opener, how would you measure him being out of... With Steve, Small, with Steve Smith, if he doesn't score as an opener, how would you measure him being out of form as a whole versus him opening the reason he's out of form? That's the... It's a perfectly valid question i don't know um i may have put that to someone in the cricket australia camp and they and they said those are tomorrow's problems <laughs> you know because they agree what if what if he averages 35 as an opener what they ha uh, do they go to him and go can you go back to the middle order and then he goes back to the middle order and he averages 27 now they've given him two bites of the cherry um so it, it, it that's a really really good one i don't know how to answer that because no one with Steve Smith's record has ever at his age started opening before. I think there should be a diminishing returns on him as a player, at, at, you know, as, as he ages out. And that's the same of any player. I would think it would be much easier for him to bat at number five or number six than it would be for him to bat um, opening the batting. So perhaps what you do is you bring him, you, you give him the chance and see how he goes over that 10 or 15 test period. If he's averaging anything over 40, you say, well, we don't think we have another opener who can average 40, which I think is probably right. Uh, we certainly don't have another opener we think could have carried his bat through that other innings, um, which again is probably right. But if he is averaging well under that, I think you go back to him and go, look, if you want to stick around, we need you to bat at five or six, probably. They may not even say that because the way their batting order is, they may not want to fit him in there, but they're probably going to have to give him an easier position and then say to him, if you can average 50 batting at number five or six, which he might still be able to do um, in a much easier batting position, we can, we're willing to take more attacking batters batting ahead of you, um, having slightly lower averages. So they, they do have that bite of the cherry available to them, but... As I said, what if he goes back to number th four or number three? Probably number four, but um, and then fails there as well. <laughs> Do they give him one more chance of going in? And it's, we are talking about, a, again, a top 10 batter of all time. But it's not working, right? And, and so if it doesn't work, if it wasn't working um, in the middle order so that he had to go to the top of the order and then it doesn't work at the top of the order and it doesn't work again in the middle of the order... Do you just keep moving them around or do you just move on? You know, there isn't that much batting talent coming through Australia. So it's, it, I think it's a tricky situation. Aditya said, if T20 had been around during the peaks of Tendulka, Ponting and Lara, what kind of batters would they have been? Would they be anchors or would they have been able to be more aggressive to suit the needs of the format? Uh, they would have been anchors because like it, that was, a, you know, if T20... 
if T20 was being played back then, it would have been played in a more def- you know, defensive style. So they all would have been anchors. I think Tenduka would have been a fast scoring anchor, uh, it, which is what he was in a one day cricket. I think, I don't know what Ponting would have been. I think that's a really interesting one. I think with Lara, you would probably look, be, I'm trying to think of a player that Lara would more be like. I'd like to think that Lara would be more in that sort of De Villiers mode, but down a gear um, just because of the era. But that kind of player um, who could do that. But you look at his one day record, you know, I don't know if, I don't know if Brian Lara took one day cricket as seriously as certainly Ponting and Tindilka did. Um, not that he wasn't fantastic at it, but I think you know, Ponting was took it so seriously and Tendulkar took it as seriously as Test cricket as well, I would say. And so you look at Lara's ODI record and he averages 40 with a strike rate of 79. And in Test cricket, he has a strike rate of 60. So I think Lara could have been that kind of Davies type player because also because he could have attacked pace and spin. Um. But yeah, I think he probably would have been more of an anchor who would have exploded at the end. Um, just because of the way... I mean, it's, it's a really hard question to answer because you have to remember that they had been trained to play a certain way and that's how cricket was. So if you're talking about Verinder Sehwag or you're talking about Viv Richards or you're talking about Andrew Simons, those sorts of... Or Chris Shrikanth, right? Even someone as random as him or Keith Stackpole... Those sorts of players, or Dougie Walters, would have gone, right? And they would have been really, really dynamic in that period. A lot of the other guys would have just turned into anchors because that's how the game would have been played at that point. Um, you know, especially the guys from, you know, from Jeff Marsh onwards. That's Desmond Hayne, Jeff Marsh onwards. That role was so defined and so many players did it. And they would have knocked the ball around in the middle and then they would have had a big you know, swing at the end. And with someone like Lara, he would have been able to occasionally break three with that. And of course, Ponting, uh, you know, Tenduka would have gone a little bit faster in the power play and Ponting would have made sure that he was on top of the team in the match situation, but not necessarily or scoring massively quick. That's how they would have played it because that's how they played one day cricket. The more interesting question is if you took their skills and their knowledge but they grew up playing T20 cricket of what they would do. I think that Tendulkar would be a better version of what Rohit Sharma has has uh, uh, could be, you know, actually that's not fair. I'm trying to think of another opener. I think Tendulkar could be a better version of what Joss Butler is um, if, if, if he came now. Ponting is weird because so much of T20 cricket is about how you play finger spin and at what and, and Ponting was absolutely fine against finger spin everywhere except for India which is where he would have to play all the finger spin in this particular in this particular tournament but assuming that he could handle that and I'd have to go back and have a look how he was against spin in in one day as but assuming he could handle that in a way that he didn't in test matches you would be looking at another he would probably open now and it would probably be a better version of Faf Duplessis. Um, better against the fastball and probably more likely to hit fours and sixes against the spinners. Uh, and then Lara, as I said, should be a B de Villiers. Or at the very least, I would want... I, actually, Lara... I'm going to take that back. Lara should be Glenn Maxwell. Combined with Joss Butler might be the best, the best way of looking at it, I think that kind of player. So I think that's where Lara would have come out. Bloody says, you have mentioned uh, that you like George Headley's other nickname, Atlas, because of how he almost single-handedly carried the 1930s West Indies side. Who else throughout cricket could be considered an Atlas? Hadley and 90s Tendulkar. I don't know if Tendulkar quite is up there, is he, Bloody? I, I wouldn't have Tendulkar on my list. I'd have Andy Flower, Basil Mahmood, Murali, um, who did we just say? Hadley. Yeah, we had Hadley already, didn't we? Um, those guys right off the top of my head um, are just, you know, so incredible. I'm trying to think if, if there's an all-rounder. 
type player earlier on. Um, but no, those are the ones that instantly stick out to me, you know, um, and it's quite often strike bowlers who don't have a backup options, right? Uh, um, who, who end up being, a, and then Andy Flower is probably, and if, if Afghanistan had played a lot of test cricket, Rashid Khan would probably be another one um, from, from that point of view. Uh, those are the ones that sort of spring to mind. I'm trying to think if I'm missing anyone. If there's anyone else from, I mean, you've got, you've also got people like, you know, Bert Sutcliffe and John Reed from New Zealand. You could say perhaps what Aravinda for Sri Lanka would have been, would probably be on a longer list. Shakib would be another one. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a few of them. Uh, Aditya says, if T20, I oh know, I've done that. I was going to say Aditya has some questions. He's still got another question. He's everywhere. Uh, I had a discussion with a friend the other day regarding who is India's greatest cricketer, Kapil or Tendulkar or someone else. Um, I was of the thought that Kapil Dev is clearly India's greatest cricketer. What are your thoughts? It's so tough because Kapil Dev is an all-round player. Um, and it depending on whether you... Are you because you're saying cricketer, you're not saying test cricketer, which is very, very different um, as well. I'm not a, as huge a fan of Kapil Dev's batting numbers as everyone else. And you always get this same thing when you talk to people about this, about both them and, and Kapil Dev. They go, yeah, but they could have batted at number six. And I'm like, yeah. But if they were really, really good, they would have just batted at number six and been really good at it all the time, right? Like, for you to say that they had the talent to bat at number six is, I'm not disagreeing with that at all, but there's a big difference between, like there's a big difference between Callis and Sobers. Callis was a good enough bowler to bowl at first and second change. Sobers was a good enough bowler to take the new ball. He ruined his figures by coming back and bowling spin. But there is a very big difference between th that level of, of player when you're looking at all-rounders. And Sobers was so good that he could bat in the top six and take the new ball. So two frontline positions, right? Callis didn't have two frontline positions, right? That's I'm not arguing that Sobers is better than Callis or, or anything like that, but I'm just talking about it from a factual point of view of how you are assembling your cricket team. Kapil Dev and Ian Botham could bat in, in the top order, right? They, could, they were good enough to bat at number six if you were willing to take a discount on your number six position which is fair. Ben Stokes is doing the same thing now. But if you look at Kapil Dev, he was a number seven and probably kind of on the borderline of being a number eight. Now, he was a very, very good number seven. I think I'd have to go back and have a look at the record, but my, my guess is that his average compared to other number sevens would be slightly above par. Well, not even slightly. He'd be about five or six runs above par, I would have thought, as an average of number sevens. And he, as a number eight, he was a great number eight, right? But that also means he averaged 31 when he batted at number seven. He probably would average around 20. He, he probably would struggle to average over 30 batting at number six is my is my guess. Um, he, he didn't do it enough to have a look at it. I know he struggled when he batted at number six, but I'm not too worried about those numbers. So so what you have is really not quite the a, a player that gives you the magical sobers thing of you have an extra player in your 11 you don't have an extra player in your 11 with with Kapil Dev what you have is a great bowler right who who went on to had a you know a seam bowler from India with a sub 30 average in that era is absolutely incredible and you have a slightly longer batting order that's handy those are handy things but if you look at his full record in test cricket um he has uh he had 800s from 131 games. So you're not talking about someone with an all-rounders, um, uh, with, with, a, with, a, with a frontline batter's record, I should say. And so you then have to think about their main skills. Let's go back to their main skills. Tendulkar's main skill, he's probably the second or third greatest batter in Test cricket history. So you've got that to start with. You've got 20 years of not having to find another great player, right? Of about I think there's about 15 years 
where Tenduka is great and a couple of years where he's average and a cu uh, on either side of him being great. Kapil Dev, we would have to go back and check Kapil Dev's bowling figures uh, um, compared to all the other seamers who bowled in Asia of that period uh, or in, certainly in India of that period to see how good 29 was. My guess is it would still be pretty fantastic. My memory of Kapil Dev's figures, and I'm not going to do the big uh, go through them now, but my memory of the figures is when you go through them, uh, he's not as good away from home as I th would have thought he would have been, especially as uh, as uh, the kind of bowler he was. You know, he's very much a similar bowler to Hadley, just not quite as, you know, perfect as Hadley was. Um, and so you had, so then you've got one person who's in the top three of all time for one skill, and you've got another person who, when combined, is really, really high up. My guess is that Tendulka is probably worth more to you, if you know, depending on how you value cricket. But it might be harder to find Kapil Dev than it is to find Tendulka. As in, you could find, especially in India, another batter who can average 48 to 55, right? Much more likely than you are ever going to be able to find someone else who's going to average sub 30 as a seam bowler with eight test centuries, right? So, does the extra greatness of Tendulkar take him to a level that it's so much better that you still would take that first? Or do you go with the bowler, which is especially seam bowling in India, which up until recently has been really hard to find, and then you also get batting with him? Do you go there? I think you can make the argument that Tendulkar is the better cricketer, the greatest cricketer, as you've said, but also make the argument that Kapil Dev is the first choice on your team sheet because he's harder to replicate. So I don't know if I've answered your question correctly, but yeah, and you would ha if you wanted me to do this properly, I would have to go through piece by piece. I, there's something I actually really want to do is going through players' records versus, you know, versus different players. So, you know, Greg Chappell versus Steve Smith and, and uh, uh, Virat Kohli versus um, uh, Sachin Tendulkar. And, you know, there's heaps of them that I've got in my mind. And it's not even, it's, it's almost like, so you can explore both players really deeply. I, I think it's a fascinating thing. And, it, you know, it will probably end up being a YouTube series that we'll do one day. And I, I really want to get to it. But that's what we would do. But once you start crossing over and you go away from just batting, and especially in Kapil Dev's case, because you've got batting and bowling, it does become so much more confusing. And you are talking to someone who would almost always pick bowlers first. Outside of Bradman, I would almost always pick a bowler first because bowlers win matches, right? Bradman is probably the main exception to that, but bowlers win matches. And so in test cricket, you go there. And if you put one day cricket in all that, Aditya, I'll never talk to you again. Anyway, we'll have a quick break here and then we'll come back. I see this plenty of uh, movement. Movement? Is movement the right word? We're going with it anyway. In the, uh, in the chat room. Uh, I'm Jared Kimber. This is The Wagon Wheel and I'll be back in a moment. A lot of people complain that I'm not a former cricketer and so that I don't really know the game. Well, you know what they can't claim? Then I don't know desks. I've been using desks for years. I'm a collector of desks, old and new, and I'm sitting on a new one right now. I'm the Don Bradman of sitting at desks. So when I tell you that the E7 Pro next generation height adjustable desk from FlexiSpot is legit. This is like Michael Jordan talking to you about sneakers. This desk holds 160 kilograms. It is as stable as anything I've ever seen, and it has under desk cable management. But really, the main skill here is that this desk rises and falls at the push of a button, and it moves super quick. And it has so many settings that remember your favorite heights. It really does it all. And I could not recommend the E7 Pro from FlexiSpot anymore, even though I am currently sitting on one of FlexiSpot's BS12 Pro multifunctional, adjustable, upgraded fabric ergonomic chairs. My butt and computer have never been happier than when using one of FlexiSpot's products. So get over to their page right now for big savings. All right, welcome back. We've got some good uh, super chats and some other chats here as well. Not that the other chats are less super, but you understand what I'm saying. Another Aditya, I'm just a, masses of Adityas everywhere um, here. Uh, Will Jacks averages 30 with a strike rate of 160. Cameron Green averages 27 with a strike rate of 145. What will it take for Jax to get a game? He'd need to be able to bowl 90 miles an hour at six foot six. That's the difference. <laughs> also, I think Will Jax is a very, very good T20 player. And I, I think we haven't seen the best of him yet at the, the higher levels. But I 
you know, lucky enough seen a lot of Surrey play, so I know how good he is. Cameron Green has already shown, you know, played some incredible international knocks. Um, so there is a big difference there. But, but if you want to know the main reason, it's about the fact that one of them is a big, tall, fast bowler as well. And the other one bowls finger spin. And it's fine. I know he's got wickets in a test match, but he's not a frontline spinner. He's probably slightly better than someone like Glenn Maxwell. He can bowl well in certain matchup situations and everything else. Cameron Green can bowl tall and fast. Now, where I would argue that against Cameron Green is the fact that he can bowl tall and fast, but he hasn't actually worked out how to bowl with a white ball at all. I'm not even sure he's that fa fantastic with a red ball. He, and we see this with all-rounders all the time. They take a little bit longer to develop. But if you're asking me who has the higher ceiling as a player, Cameron Green's is higher than Will Jacks. But Will Jacks might end up still being a fantastic T20 player. Um, and... I, I have no issues with him coming into the side, but you're talking about two very different things. Also, the, the my guess is that Will Jacks is, uh, oh my God. So if, if you were to take Cameron Green out of that side, who is currently bowling a lot, right? Uh, you would then, have, I'm just having a look. So Cameron Green comes out, so you lose a seam bowling all-rounder and you bring in another off-spinning all-rounder. Aditya, what? Uh, how is that going to work when you have two off-spinning part-time plus bowlers um, in the same side? Like You can't get overs out of Jax and Maxwell. You can get overs out of Jax or Maxwell. Uh, you might argue that that is not the right team for Will Jax to be at. Now I'm completely on your side. Naveen says, in Dan Weston's latest thread on RCB, he mentions that there is a scarcity of good Indian local bowlers compared to batters. Will teams prefer... Um, overseas heavy bowling attacks, then batting lineups next auction. I mean, they should. Well, basically, what you do uh, when you're working for, um, you know, uh, when you're working for a franchise is the first thing that I look for is what is the skill that is abundant that I can get really good players slightly cheaper for. So, you know, India anchor batters. It's all always anchor batters. And then what would the other thing be? It would be batters who can face. 15 balls with a strike rate of 25 uh, with a, with 25 runs who can probably bowl on over to a finger spin right those two things are th those two things are the easiest to find so what am what are the seventh eighth ninth best choices for those that i can get um because i can get them for cheap and i can stack stack up a bunch of them if i want which give me flexibility in my lineup what can't i get and that i will need to overpay for in the indian market i, I probably want you know Hardik Pandya is, is something that I can't get. Jasper Boomer is something that I can't get. I almost put Chahal as a genuine frontline leg spinner. Um, but, you know, you would have Cool Deep and, and, um, and Ravi Bishnoi probably on that list as well. Those, again, those are more of the rarer things. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of how you, you do it. And you, you, you go through and you work out what your um, depth chart is. And you're going to quite quickly see that in seam bowling, there probably isn't as many options available to you and you still bowl, most teams still bowl more seam than spin. So in India, uh, it makes sense to, you know, find overseas players who can do that. But what you want to do to start with is start by overpaying your local players and getting 12 playable local players would be the ideal scenario. And then when you've got those 12 players that you've all been able to afford in your squad, you then go, okay, what do we not have? Oh, we don't have a wrist spinner. Okay, great. Um, who's the best overseas wrist spinner available at the moment? All right, we'll bring him in. Okay, we don't have a left arm quick bowler. All right, uh, can we get one trusted left arm quick bowler and one backup left arm quick bowler? That's how you should put these squads together. But as I've just said, RCB have two all-rounders who probably both need to bat in the top three or four um, who both bowl off spin. Oren says, how much Sam Cook have you seen? Do you feel like he has enough different skills to be a good test bowler? I think he's incredibly skillful. I think he's a little bit slow. And I think your follow-up question was, the only thing he doesn't have um, compared to Ollie Robertson is height. That is a massive difference because Ollie Robertson at six foot tall is not quite Muhammad Abbas. Ollie Robertson at six foot seven with a huge wingspan, or actually, what is he, six foot five, but with a huge wingspan, is 
a pretty regular test bowler with an incredible record. That's the difference, right? It is very hard to be Muhammad Abbas in, in modern cricket or Vern, you know, even Vernon Philander. You, you know, need to be lucky or you need to be so skillful that you can overcome it. I have seen enough of Sam Cook to say that as skillful as he is, I don't know if he's that level skillful. You know, few humans ever are. Um, and because of that, um, it doesn't seem it doesn't seem likely to me. But I, I don't know if I've seen his speeds to see where he is because there's a big difference between 81 miles an hour to 85 miles an hour and 88 miles an hour. So I'd need to see more of him, but I think he's a really talented bowler. Uh, Happy says, could Punjab play Chris Wokes instead of Sam Curran? So they would have the exact same issue, right? So let's say they do that. Where, where does Chris Wokes have to bowl? It's going to have to bowl with the, say it with me now, the new ball. Where does Ashdeep Singh have to bowl? Say it with me now, the new ball. Where does Rabada want to bowl? Say it with me now, the new ball. So they would be bringing in the same problem. Uh, Curran, Wokes is not a better death bowl than Curran. I don't think he's massively uh, worse. I think they're both around pretty ordinary, uh, okay death bowlers at times. Um but neither of them are massive plus with the with the with the death bowling. Um, and uh, Wokes is a batter, uh, but not on the current level, and he's not as flexible and um, as current. Although I really like Wokes' batting, but it feels like it's dropped off a little bit in the last couple of years. Um, but yeah, you you're still picking the same problem, which of course comes back to what we were saying before of the overlap issue, especially with overseas players. Path says, my friend says if uh, Punjab had uh, the Titans background staff, they would be in the finals as well. How wrong or right is he? Uh, why do people keep trusting Umesh at the death? His record is horrendous. Um, I just think there's some really good things about the background staff of, of the Titans. I think Vikram Solanke is a really, really thorough person. Um, I think there's some other, you know, really smart thinking around that that kind of stuff. Um, I'm not. I mean, it depends. My guess is that if Punjab had a GT's background staff, they'd still stuff it up because the ownership group would stuff it up. I think that's the issue at Punjab. Plain and simple. Um, why do people keep trusting Umesh at the death? They're not trusting him at the death. What they're doing is they know he's only really good in the power play. But it's very hard to be a power player only bowler. And there aren't many of those left in the league. Um, and so generally you have to come back and bowl again. And they're not particularly strong. Um, you know, they, they only need him for hopefully one or two because they have other um, uh, bowlers that can do it. But he's still going to have to bowl at the death. Um, he's a erratic, occasionally good um, power play bowler and pretty ordinary for, generally for the rest of the innings. If there's four overs to bowl, there's only you can only get three in the power play, and generally it's hard for anyone to bowl all three in the power play. So, when else is he going to bowl? You're either picking him to be two two games at that point. Stags says, is there an argument in T20 to try and not dismiss a batter if they're an anchor, and so that they're still batting by say the 13th over? There are certainly certain innings where. <laughs> you can make make that claim really really easily right where you can just go we can keep this guy in in general if i my god i just had a thing that i could have shown you that would have i can quickly i'm going to share my screen and i'll try and explain it for the podcast audience as well just because i happen to have something uh coming up uh that kind of explains this very good let me find it strike rate in five ball intervals. Uh, sorry, it's. I don't know if I can make it any bigger than that. So essentially, this is all the players who have um, faced more than fifty balls in an innings in IPL uh, ten times, and you can see most of the. They're almost all slow starters. Butler's the only quicker starter, and even he's slow. Um, although he gets a bit quicker after ten balls, but they're mostly all slow starters. They go through this period in the middle where the strike rate sort of plateaus and then they all kind of kick up at the end. So if we look at the two slowest um, scorers, we've got KL. Is that Rahane? We've got KL Rahul, Rahane and Gambia. 
as the three slowest scorers. Oh yeah, they're all in this area down here. They're scoring and around their 50th ball at a strike rate of 135. So the, the question always is, is it not better to be in a situation at, you know, in that second part of your innings where where you have a guy who's gonna score at 135 strike rate and who is set and who is comfortable compared to bringing in a new batter who has to get set and comfortable and probably will start a little bit slow anyway. So maybe for the first five balls, they're gonna have a strike rate of under 135 and they might not last more than five balls. And you get a wicket, which allows you to put more pressure back on the opposition. So it's my, my point would be that there are batters that this is probably a theory worth trying. And there are batters that there aren't. The vast majority, probably not. But, you know, Sai Sudarshan um, is someone that I think can get incredibly stuck. And Rahane, tr traditionally not at the moment, is someone who gets incredibly stuck. K.R.O. will hit out, but he'll wait really late before he starts to hit out. And so even if he does damage, he might have already, you know, cost his team 10 or 15 runs by not going around the 13th over. I do, th th teams have been talking about this for a long time we will start to see teams not try and dismiss players. Uh, whether that will be intentional drops or not, I don't know. But we will see teams start not to try and dismiss players. Whether it's in the next five years or not, I don't know. But these conversations are had in the change room all the time. Varun, who uh, actually put that last, um, um, uh, what do you call it, graphic together. That was his. Um, he says, on Kapil, could his poor away records in New Zealand and England be due to him being over bowled? From memory, he averaged 30 overs a match in Asia and 40 in England and New Zealand. So Richard Hadley. Uh, let's have a look at Richard Hadley. Uh, Richard Head. I, I would assume that Richard Hadley averaged, you know, a, a similar amount of overs. My memory of that Varun is that Garfield Sobers averaged 38 overs um, a game and did it on a much higher um, batting load than than Kapil Dev had. Um, and I would say that Jimmy Anderson's around 36, 37 um, of modern bowlers, and he does that with a third bowler in. I think I'm right in saying all this. Uh, so Hadley averaged 43 overs per game. So if that's the case, and I'm not saying it is or isn't, but if that's the case, then that's an issue that should have been put on, put on because clearly he wasn't fit enough to bowl the overs that he needed to bowl that other bowlers were willing to bowl and did throughout their careers. Um, you know, in Hadley's case, he did it everywhere, right? Um, and looking at the athlete that Kapil Dev was, like if you told me that was Ian Botham's reason, I'd be like, it's probably fair. They made him bowl more and he, you know, he, he wasn't in control of his fitness anymore and, and it cost him some problems. I find it hard to believe that Kapil Dev got tired. Um, and if you're a test bowler, uh, you know, bowling um, 40 overs a match is pretty standard, right? A fr frontline test seamer in his era, that was kind of what was expected. Um, you know, I think there was a, a lot of, I think there's a lot of bowlers in the world uh, that can bowl that amount of overs and did it regularly and were nowhere near the kind of athletes that Kapil Dev was. Like he, you know, he was an athlete on a completely separate level uh, when it comes to, I just want to look up one other bowler just to compare him. Uh, one, two, two, eight, five. So in his career, Merv Hughes bowled 38 and a half overs per game. And Varun, you're, you're a younger guy than me. Go and Google Merv Hughes and have a look at the kind of athlete he was. If he could bowl 38 and a half overs per game, I think I don't think Kapil Dev was being over bowled, being asked to bowl 40. Uh, yeah. <laughs> ABCD says, what was ABD's technique best suited to when it came to success in all formats? Uh, or was it other factors? he has the most time to play any ball. So everything stops for him in a way that it doesn't for anyone else. And so he can make better decisions all the way through because of that one skill. So every every great batter has a different skill. Like, you know, so Steve Smith's main thing is this incredible ability to play with the technique that takes away the off, uh, the top of off stump and, and outside deliveries, right? 
But that doesn't really work in T20 cricket. So that main skill that he has doesn't translate over. If your main skill is actually reading the bowlers quicker than everyone else and having that extra half, you know, millisecond um, available to you, then that means that you can be successful in any format. Then it's just about the kind of athlete you are, the kind of shots that you have, um, and whether you can play pace and spin. And A.B. De Vies was an incredible athlete. He had a brilliant technique and he could play pace and spin. So it's all that. And the other thing would probably be a little bit of mindset, right? Of He really liked to dominate one day cricket and then T20 cricket. And that's not the case for Virat Kohli and Steve Smith and Kane Williamson. That's not how they want to play that, that kind of game. So it's very different. Was he the most gifted, talented batter post Bradman? It's a fascinating question. Because you would also, there's a couple of South Africans, like where does Barry Richards fit into that? Um, Lara has to fit into that as well. Viv Richards probably has to fit into that as well. I would have him maybe slightly below the other one, those other ones, although he's, they're all in the same argument. Um, it, yeah, it's, I, I don't think he's quite there, but he's probably, if you're talking about raw natural gifts, I think he had more of them than some of the other players who are better than him yeah, or did better than him altogether. So I, th I, I, I think that's a very fair um, comment. Um, I, I don't think he is like the best player since Bradman, but I think it's very fair to ask the question is what I mean. Uh, Rupesh says, when it comes to choosing greatest cricketers, why is Test Cricket prioritized and ODIs and T20s have low priority? Um, because for the first 30 years of ODI cricket, no one played it seriously. It's a big part of it. It's much harder to be good at Test Cricket than it is in those other formats. Um, they are limited and by and you know you don't have to face the best bowlers over and over again, right? In, in a in a test match, you are facing the best bowlers, and they are bowling a huge percentage of the overs. You know, we just talked about Kapil Dev and Richard Hadley and Gufford Sobers and and Merv Hughes bowling you know uh, forty overs per test match. That's a lot of you going up against the best bowler, right? If you're making runs, you're not doing that in in ODI cricket. ODI cricket is more of a formula. It's a different kind of cricket. It tests you in different ways, but the best team doesn't win as often as test cricket because there is more random. Uh, for the first, I would say one day cricket starts getting taken really seriously in the early 2000s by all teams, right? That means that for over 30 years, it was not taken seriously and teams did not train for it or plan for it correctly. T20 cricket, again, what, around 2012, 2012 was Sri Lanka, wasn't it? So I'd say the first, what, decade of T20 cricket also wasn't taken that seriously. The other thing is that, you know, what cricketers will say is that the best player can play all three formats and test cricket is the hardest format. If you're good at the white ball formats, you're not quite as good. But a lot, as I said, a lot of it is like in 50 years time, these conversations might change. Um, but, but Rupesh, those are the main reasons. It just isn't as, as, as hard. That doesn't mean it can't be your favorite format or someone else's favorite format. And I think, you know, for someone like, I've, I've got a chapter in my book about Michael Bevan and women's cricket. And the reason that it's in there is because we don't see Michael Bevan as one of the greatest batters of all time. And yet Michael Bevan completely changed the way we played one day cricket. And up until the year 2000, no one had ever averaged 50 in one day cricket. And he did. And so the chapter is really about this juxtaposition of why was why can someone be so good at this format and not translate it to the other format? And how does that affect how we see this person who never made any runs in test cricket? I must have averaged, what, 20 or 30? Um, and, and so it's a, it's a really, really fascinating um, situation. Um, generally, when if you see Rupesh, I don't know how often you've been here before, but if, if you've seen when people come here... Um, you know, we, we get to a point where we um, uh, where people ask about the greatest cricketer. I always ask what format because I find it really hard to go across formats in my head, uh, especially when you start going through history because Bradman didn't play as much T20 cricket as you'd think. Pa says, Rahane was doing well uh, and then, uh, was doing well. Ravindra and Rutu came off at the top. Is there an argument that these anchors wicket is more expensive than their runs? 
Oh, Path, I don't understand this, mate. Sorry. Um, uh, Shashank Singh can certainly not get centuries like Darwin. Uh, I'm really confused by what you you mean here, Path. You might need to re-explain that um, uh, a little bit. Uh, Shashank Singh can certainly not get centuries like Darwin. Yeah, so, uh, you, you know, there there is a... It's the, the way that it was first made really clear to me was through highways, which is the problem with a lot of T20 um, situations is we, we get a star player in and he's going to make a lot of the runs. But in order to make a lot of the runs, he takes up a lot of the resources as well. And eventually that highway gets clogged, right? And so you are, then if there's an accident on that highway, you've got nothing to go back to. What you actually want when you are making highways or making new roads is not to make them, like everyone's always like, why don't they just add more lanes? Well, generally when you add more lanes to a highway, you actually just clog it more. What you really want is a highway that eases the overall congestion, but there are still plenty of people willing to take um, the original roads or other options, right? So T20 cricket has been really pushed towards this highway anchor style of we need people to bat as long as possible and face as many balls as possible and go about it from that point of view and so what we are doing in um now what teams are starting to do especially with the impact sub but teams have been trying this for a little while is how do we split our batting so that we have you know three uh, three main roads three smaller roads and and a, and a couple of shortcuts that no one ever knows about so that there are lots of different people making runs and sharing it so that a failure of one player doesn't have the same impact. And that's the difference of what the, you know, what the future of, of T20 cricket is probably going to be. And that's where we're going at the moment. And it's, it's interesting and it's filled with risks as well. The impacts up, as I said, does make it easier, but I think there's a lot of us who believe that sort of, if you've got a couple of guys who are good batters and are going to make more runs naturally anyway, and you know that you have them in your side, whether they're anchors or not. They might be guys who strike at 150, but if they can average 30, and then you can find a bunch of guys averaging between 20 and 25 who can bat from position one to position eight, and then you've got a hitter at position nine, you can all, you can actually have more. Um, you you are harder to scheme for. Um, you uh, if one or two of your main players go out it's not as big a deal all these sorts of things play a big role so the, the way that t20 cricket is going ahead um is very very different uh than it has been so far so path said rani was batting at a good strike rate when ravindra was batting well at the top but ravindra and and ratu fell early and he slowed down yeah i mean and that, that's the issue here is um it depends on how what your batting lineup is and how confident you feel um, that path, what you're basically explaining there is the in-game Evan Golbus effect, right? Whereas he suddenly looked up and just been like, oh, now we have lost a couple of wickets. Oh, I need to go back and bat properly for a little bit. Whereas what we are trying to train younger players in is, no, you keep playing the way you're playing. You are in this side and Rahane is now in as a guy who's supposed to be scoring at a really good strike rate. That's what you are in the side to do. Don't pull back because... On top of losing the wickets, we've now also got a slowdown. So we've given the opposition two pluses, not one. And it's getting people to rethink about that mindset, especially in a team uh, that has a really long batting order. Um, but sometimes it's nothing to do with all that. It could just be that Rahane went up against spin that he couldn't hit at that point. It could be that there was a bad matchup. It could be that when the ball got a little bit older, it wasn't coming onto the bat the way he wanted to anymore. And we do have to factor all of those things in uh, when we're looking at, at, the, at these things. Anyway, that's it for me today. Um, uh, Got to go pick up the boys from cricket. But thank you to everyone for their support, especially uh, you super chatters at the end. But I also see who uh, Max and Abdullah, and I said Rahul was in here again. Uh, Hypercost. Um, I, I, in fact, Hypercost says Chamari Adapatu is another Atlas. It's a very good one. I, I, there, I think there'll be a few in the women's game as well. Um, but big thanks to everyone who put their comments in. And of course, everyone who supported us on Patreon. You can go to patreon.com forward slash Jared Kimber to help support us. Um, or you can go and find any of our sponsors. And goodareas.co is where we uh, put up the majority of our work. Also, 
cricket8.com. We have a partnership with them at the moment. Go over and have a look at all the stuff that we're making for them, including live watch-alongs on the weekend of the IPL games. I've got to go. I've got to pick up my kids and I've just, I've just got to go. I'm, I've, I've got to go. Ever wonder why slower deliveries work? What a zombie ball is or how Sunil Gavaskar would have batted in T20? Well, we have the channel for you, Good Areas. Twice a week, we have a new deep dive into a great story from cricket on our main channel, Good Areas. It is the history and present of cricket as narrated by me. If you make any content, Memento is the tool for you. Take your long format pods and meetings and anything you have and let Memento cut and slice it up for social media. This AI-inspired weapon will turn your one piece of work into so many